Hello, friends. Uncle Marv here, not with another episode of the podcast, but a very special session that we are calling Chats with a Guru. And I am joined by our good friend from the community, Diana Giles from Skyline IT Management. Giles, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I am doing good. So this is a session and it's actually going to be a series of sessions that Giles and I came up with where we thought, you know what? People always have questions about 365 and the cloud and Azure. And we decided, why don't we put together something and it'll be kind of a conversation, kind of a teaching session. You Giles as the 365 guru helping the Yahoo like me make that transition because believe it or not, a lot of my clients, most of my clients still have physical servers. We have not yet lifted anybody 100% to the cloud. Of course, we're doing 365 for email. I've got a client or two doing SharePoint, but they're not 100% cloud. So this will be a great opportunity to chat and teach about 365. Does that sound good? That sounds great. All right. So why don't we go ahead and start with your background and explain to people who you are, Skyline IT Management, and how you became that 365 guru. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, let's see. Um, I've had my business for quite some time, but it was you know mainly part time after I uh, left my IT job to stay home with my kids and. Uh, my business slowly, so slowly grew from the computer monkey uh, to Skyline IT management when I made the transition in around 2019 to kind of move away from break fix uh, as a model and move toward an MSP model. And then during that process, I became uh, you know, affiliated with PAX8 and they provided some uh, wonderful resources, training, uh, really kind of, you know, letting us know as an MSP community what Microsoft 365 and uh, their cloud offerings really could do, not only for our business, but really for our clients and then therefore for our business. And I really embraced it. I saw that that was where the future was and it was really a good opportunity, I thought, for most of um, my clients, at least the ones, you know, who could move fully cloud. We always have some that can't for various reasons, line of business apps and things like that. But even that is is changing, even that some of those line of business apps we're getting, uh, you know, through Azure or other uh, options, we have, you know, we're even able to move some things we didn't think we could before. So uh, that was just kind of when I got my feet wet and I started working on the Microsoft 365 Administrator Expert um, Certification. And really that was just, you know, for me so that I could be able to really kind of feel like I was informed enough to be that expert for my clients. And uh, as I've done that, I've also kind of worked with some other organizations to help them make that transition as well. Maybe they didn't want to put in the time or, you know, they didn't have the resources or time to do it themselves. And so they've hired me to, to work on that for them as well. So I've done some cloud migrations and tenant setups for some other uh, companies as well as my own. And uh, it's like, I guess that answered your question. Yeah. Now, when you talk about lifting them to the cloud, are you doing 100% cloud, meaning you're doing their data, you're doing their Active Directory, uh, anything else that you're throwing up in the cloud for them? Uh, yes. I mean, just if they have, most of my clients that are cloud only do not have a line of business app, but I have had one recently where they had kind of a custom app. And so I contracted with another company. In fact, we did a podcast about that um, with Kristen from Solutions uh, to move their app to Azure. So, um, you know, that those are the kinds of things that, that I would do if somebody had an app like that and uh, needed to move it 
to the cloud if it was able to. So I'm I'm pretty much only taking on new clients that are either ready to move to the cloud, want to ditch their server, uh, or are already free of a server. Okay. So that explains a lot for me because most of my clients still have a line of business app that is tied to the terrestrial server and they've not yet figured out a way to migrate their apps to the cloud, but it's coming. So of course I wanted to, to learn a little bit about that. Let's first talk about the benefits of moving somebody to the cloud. Obviously we, we know that with email, you know, you can get your email from anywhere, any device, you just, you know, open up your outlook or an app or something, and you can get the email. Uh, what types of other things can users benefit from moving fully to the Azure cloud? Yeah, well, it really, a lot of it in, involves security uh, because of, you know, as we know, it's kind of like comparing uh, on-prem exchange to exchange online. There's just a lot more security built into the online uh, you know, cloud version. We've been doing that for a while. So you can take it a step further with everything else as well. Uh, it's a lot of it is convenience, being able to have access to your data from whatever device, but then also on the company side, there's a security, uh, data security uh, there. So that you don't have to necessarily be concerned that your staff would have access on their phones to company data because it can be managed by Microsoft 365 Business Premium and the uh, the security controls you get with mobile device management if you want or just application management so that the company data can be wiped from that device without touching their personal information. But if somebody were to leave, you know, they've got that control. So that's, you know, another thing. Uh, and when I talk about it um, as far as like the Microsoft 365 cloud, because most of the people listening to this podcast, I would say, are familiar with Microsoft 365. But I'm kind of comparing basically business standard or even business basic and, you know, the limitations to that versus the cloud. When, when I talk about taking somebody to Microsoft 365, you know, in a cloud environment, we're talking about business premium. At least that's, you know, what I talk about. Uh, obviously, larger organizations might be, you know, doing, you know, E3 or E5, but for small business, one to 300 users, uh, business premium is going to be this cloud option. And the way that I explain it to people, you know, like my clients, um, is that that server is now the Microsoft cloud. And so business premium kind of takes the place of that on-prem server because, you know, yes, it is more expensive per user and that kind of thing, but the authentication, the security controls and all of that, that you had with the server on premises now are going to be handled by Azure AD and the, the whole, you know, Microsoft 365 cloud. So I think one of the hardest things to convey to clients, uh, not so much, you know, us in, in tech, but to our clients is, because they just think of Microsoft 365 as Word, Excel, you know, Outlook, and it's it's that's really such a tiny part of it when you're looking at business premium and everything that it can do. So I was going to ask you to explain a little more, but you started to do some of that. And of course, this is obviously much different than just simply getting your email with an exchange online one or two plan. And you mentioned the difference between 365 business basic, business standard, business premium, versus the e 3 d 5 It's all confusing. It's a lot of, yeah. of licenses. And of course the customers, you know, have a hard time with it. I have a customer that I just uh, onboarded that had most of their licenses as the business basic, mm -hmm. which they thought was just fine for them. If somebody needed to go, you know, work with Word or Excel, they would use the web version. Come to find out a bunch of them were using an office, Pro Plus license oh. that just started expiring on them. So we've been upgrading a lot of them to just the business standard because their only mindset is, well, we just need the apps. So you're talking about going beyond the apps and actual doing management. Now, 
I've looked at this and I know that there's device management in there, mm -hmm. but what actually is built into the premium license that's more than the standard? Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's really, um, it's really pretty significant. It's hard to get your mind around it um, without kind of a visual representation, uh, which there is, we can put in the show notes or however you want to do it. There's some really good websites that are a good website that you can go that really lays it out very clearly and you can, you can uh, really see the difference. So I can even show that if you want, or we can just put it in the notes, sure. but it um, aside from just the apps, obviously, when you're getting into the business premium aspect of it, besides security, because business premium includes Microsoft uh, Defender for Business in there as well. But you also have um, all of these policies that you can deploy, conditional access, uh, which is, is very significant in providing security to who can log into your Microsoft account. And uh, in addition to all of the security, which it is really extensive, you also have um, much more, you know, as far as compliance goes and how the buckets of data can be controlled, the kinds of things that you can do with um, labels and uh, deciding, you know, uh, protecting against information as far as PII uh, and, you know, deciding who has access in your company even to certain information. You know, maybe the accounting team has access to certain data, but the others don't. And I mean, all of that can be, uh, you know, controlled with Microsoft Purview, which is basically the compliance piece of Microsoft 365. And then there is, of course, the Intune and the mobile device management, which does not necessarily, I mean, you can do extensive mobile device management, uh, which, you know, we always do on the Windows machines. Uh, when people log in to their Microsoft account on their computer, they are logging in essentially like you, you did with the same type of controls, I might argue even better controls um, into Azure AD that are controlling that authentication and that access to that device and all of the data on it. But in addition to that, with Intune, you can also control the uh, you know applications and devices as far as like iOS devices, people who have or companies who have uh, company phones, or if they just want to allow their uh, staff to use their personal devices, you can just do mobile application management and control what is allowed, preventing, for example, them being able to copy and paste company information, uh, you know, into some other place on that device. So uh, let's see what, else. well, besides SharePoint also. So your storage, your data um, storage that, you know, we're used to the file, uh, the server acting as a file server often. And so now SharePoint takes the place of that. Uh, with SharePoint comes also OneDrive and those are you know very much related. So you've got the ability to um, have your data accessible from whatever device you might be working at. And that's you know really great for people when they're traveling and that kind of thing, or work from home situations. And then of course there's Teams, which is a whole other, you know, kind of platform to itself almost. Um, but that is, you know, definitely another part of Microsoft 365. Okay. So that was a mouthful. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of these are separate. So I know that we're used to hearing Intune and you're you're talking about Intune as the deployment and the MDM together? Yes, it's as much as you want it to be. I mean, okay. you know, you can use uh, Intune strictly for deploying Windows or you can, you know, carry it through to other devices like, you know, iOS. You can, uh, do complete mobile device management if you want to with Apple's program or with Google Play. You know, there's a significant amount of setup involved in doing that. This would be for corporate devices, or you can simply just uh, control the access to the app, to the company data on the personal device using uh, mobile application management. All right. So 
let me just ask this question just because it's rattling around in my head. I'm sure somebody else has it as well. For companies that still do a lot of their work at an office, it sounds like this might be a bit much. I, I see this as something where you've got mobile users, you've got multiple offices, you've got people that are in and out of the office all the time. And if you wanna be able to manage stuff and not have to touch them and have it tied to their Microsoft account or their email, this would be a great thing to do. For companies that are still kind of tied to an office space, and they're gonna have shared files locally, does it make sense to do all of this? Or is there a hybrid way where you can kind of sync some of it to the cloud and have it available when needed? Well, the answer is yes to both. I mean, okay. yes, you can do the hybrid, um, something called Azure AD Sync. So you can actually get the advantages of you know, the Microsoft 365 cloud along with your server. And so that is definitely possible. But I would say even if you have an office where nobody is working from home and very you know, few people even travel or have a laptop, you still get a significant amount of benefit, I think, from just how the uh, devices authenticate and, are, and then they perform and how you can control them as far as what, you know, applications are automatically deployed for, uh, for the staff there. If you have ever um, seen an autopilot, you know, restore after having to, um, you know, either uh, take a device away or just refresh a device because of problems. And then when you deploy autopilot and it just all comes back and it's all there, it's very nice. I mean, and that of course is on the IT management side, but that also makes it easier for the, uh, the users as well. They, they benefit from that too. All right. Now, another side question that just popped up, there needs to be internet access for this, right? So if somebody's working from home, they, you know, they decide to go on a vacation to the mountains of Georgia and stuff. What if there's no good Wi-Fi? Can they still function? They can function. There's going to be some things that they're not going to be able to do. Obviously, I mean, if you don't have internet, you're not going to be able to get your email. You can just, you know, work offline. You're going to have, um, like for your files that are on the computer, you would be limited to the ones that were already there um, in OneDrive. You wouldn't have access to what they call files on demand, where you, you know, have a placeholder for a file and you click on it and it pulls it down from the cloud. So you would be limited to, you'd just be working offline, but you could still get on your computer and all of that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned files on demand. So that's, I, we didn't talk about that earlier. So tell me. Yeah. Tell okay. me that. Well, that's kind of, yeah, that would be kind of part of the OneDrive and SharePoint. Okay. So. Um, you have the option when you're using OneDrive, every user, I guess I'll back up a little bit, every user in Microsoft 365 um, would have a terabyte of storage for them personally. And when we say personally in this regard, this is business personal, not their home pictures and things like that, but they're the company files that they personally use, not accessible to everybody. So you get a terabyte there. Well, you can decide, let's say you have a, a device that's only got 256 gigabytes on it. Maybe they have, you know, 600 gigabytes of data. So you utilize files on demand. They still have all of their, you know, whole terabyte available to them, but the files are only the that they use all the time are the ones that are kept on the device. So they'll be you'll indicate differently in in File Explorer, you'll have a green check mark or you'll have a blue cloud, you know, depending on whether it is on the device or available to be on the device. So that's files on demand. All right. The reason I thought of that is because most of the desktops and laptops that are being deployed, at least in my clients, those users are coming only with 500 gigs of solid state drive storage. My first thought is if we're gonna make everybody, you know, use their Microsoft account, 365 premium, 
they're going to use that terabyte of data, then they probably should have a terabyte of local storage. Yeah, no, well. they don't have to. But the files on demand makes it to where they don't. Right, now, right. If they've now, touched it in the last 30 days, it'll be on their computer. Otherwise, it'll go back to the cloud. Okay. And then they can have access to it again if they need it. Right. And is, this, is that set by default or do we need to set that when we set up the user? Uh, well, when you set up the user and you log them into OneDrive for the first time, you go through the settings kind of a little wizard and decide how to how you want it to be done. It's also something that you set up in the configurations when you're doing uh, if if you're doing like an Intune deployment. So it would be part of that device's uh, configuration on how you want OneDrive to be set up. So. Uh, for example, one thing that I really like when it's appropriate is, and this is kind of related because SharePoint and OneDrive are very much related, SharePoint would be the company storage files. You can set up an automatic uh, deployment when that machine is set up through uh, Intune that the SharePoint files automatically sync to that machine in File Explorer, the company files. So you can you can do that if you want. You don't have to. Those are the kind of things that you can like even with OneDrive, where we were talking about the files on demand. Those can be uh, set up as policies in your deployment for your endpoints. So the user would have a OneDrive set up with files on demand, and they would have a SharePoint. I'm assuming it's a link, or would you do you do map drives? It looks like. And essentially, it looks like a mapped drive, but it's not. It's actually got a little building instead of the little blue cloud that you have with OneDrive. Um, but that's how you designate that it's, you know, company files. And those can be, it can be set up in your, you know, configuration in Intune to make that happen automatically, or it can be done manually too. So I'm thinking of the client that I've got that we're talking about moving them to the cloud. They're I mean, they're not a huge client, but they're big. I mean, there's more than 50 people there. They've got about 10 terabytes of local storage. So moving them to a cloud environment, throwing all their stuff up in, in SharePoint, I mean, does it make sense to have that much up there and then always syncing with this file on demand feature? Well, it's not necessarily going to be, you know, it's it's more like a placeholder. It's not like those files are going to, you know, always be there. They would have a placeholder. But one of the things um, that we have to kind of think about when you're moving somebody from, you know, a file server to SharePoint is you do really have to take a look at what their data is and who needs access to that data. Um, is it, are these files that, only you know one user uses or are they files that everybody uses and because you can if everybody gets a terabyte of one drive some of those files if they're only being accessed by one person then they should go in their one drive as opposed to going to the company sharepoint so it is really important when you're look at mo looking at moving somebody to the cloud to really take a look at the data and determine you know okay First of all, is there too much to move to the cloud? And it, it's not so much, um, it, it can depend on the quantity of the files in a particular bucket, right? I had a client or have a client that we could move a lot of their company files to SharePoint and sync them with File Explorer, but they had this one repository of files that was just too large. There was no way um, syncing would have been a nightmare. And so they go directly to SharePoint in a web browser for, for that particular bucket, if you will, of files. Everything else syncs through File Explorer as you know each particular person needs. Okay. So, wow. So getting started sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> Well, yes, it really is. I mean, in doing your homework as far as really kind of taking a look at what their current layout is, what their current data needs are, is really, really important. Um, because, you know, 
it's very easy for us and I do it. I mean, I'm guilty of it where we say, oh yeah, we can do that. Oh yeah, we can do that because we know what's possible. And then you kind of get down into the nitty gritty of how they actually use that data and okay, well, maybe that situation, okay, maybe that's better if we put the Synology on site for that. You know, there, there can be those situations. You just have to uh, evaluate everything really carefully ahead of time. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's get ready for a break here, and then we'll come back and dive a little bit more into what you actually do when you get started with a client. But before we do that, let's at least talk about is this something that's better to just, if you get a client, you start fresh with them? Is it easier to start fresh and rebuild everything? Or is it possible to transition a client from on-prem to cloud without too much trouble? Right. Um, it depends, obviously, on the situation. But yes, it's very possible to transition them through you know, the, the hybrid situation or just even if you're not going to do the, the hybrid, just to um, use the Azure AD sync to grab everything from the server and move them to you know the Microsoft Cloud if you're planning to eventually get rid of the server. Um, also, if, you know, obviously we can bring them from Google Suite, uh, you know, Google Workforce if we um, want to. So migrations are Typically, what um, I guess what I do most of the time, we'll just you know do a migration uh, through BitTitan and that kind of thing because usually I'm bringing somebody over from uh, Google Suite or even um, you know well it's not really a migration with GoDaddy but you know moving them over from GoDaddy uh, or even uh, splitting them off from another Microsoft tenant had to do that. Uh, it's it, it really does depend on the situation, but if you can start fresh, it's always nice just to have a clean slate, but it's certainly not necessary. You can take somebody who's just been on business standard and upgrade them to business premium and then do the additional setup in their tenant, you know, that's that now that you have all these add-on features. Did that answer your question? It did. It okay. did. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a quick break here, folks. Uh, we ask you to come back and join us for our next session. And uh, we've been talking with Dinah Giles from Skyline IT Management. Her information will be in the show notes. And if you're watching the video, there is her website address. And she'll be able to answer any questions you have and assist you if you are a managed service provider and you need assistance in migrating your clients. Uh, She's happy to help. So uh, Giles, we'll be back in just a second, all right? Okay, sounds good.